Okay. So let's talk, just let's talk before we get into some of the benefits as well. I do want to talk about the energy system and how it's actually used in the body. So we're going to talk about muscle and the uptake into muscle, but in particular, we have this phosphocreatine system, which is the, I'll let you explain it, but you know, what does it do and how does it provide the muscle primarily with this sort of immediate source of energy? Yeah. When we consume creatine through the diet or supplementation or the creatine release from the liver, it simply enters your bloodstream and then it's taken into your demanding tissues. About 95% is taken in the skeletal muscle. The leftover is between the bone, testes, and the brain primarily. But once creatine becomes uh, trapped or inside the cell, it's phosphorylated with a phosphate bond, and then it becomes a larger molecule. Uh, Therefore, it can't leave. It can't leak out, so to speak. And once it's in there and trapped, that's a very good thing. If you go all the way back to your high school biology, fossil creatine is needed to maintain or resynthesize a molecule called ATP or adenosine triphosphate. And everybody listening remembers, oh, ATP is the energy currency of all our cells. Anytime we move, shoveling the driveway in a couple months here in Canada, gardening, playing soccer or weightlifting, we're using our muscles. And the more muscle activity you use, You put more reliance on ATP, and that's where creatine really comes into play. It it sort of sacrifices itself. It donates a phosphate group to maintain the energy currency cell of our molecule. Therefore, if you have more ATP longer, you can exercise longer at a higher capacity. Okay, great. So let's talk about muscle and let's talk about some of the benefits around it. So we have in the muscle, there are different types of muscle. There's slow twitch, fast twitch, or type one, type two. Is there a preferential uptake between type one and type two fibers that take up creatine? There is. So type two or large muscle fibers, we use those during a leg press or a bench press, and those have preferential uptake and storing capacity. So type two muscle fibers have the largest storing capacity of creatine compared to type one muscle fibers. So anybody involved in high performance anaerobic type of sports will be relying more on type two muscle fibers when you're doing uh, repetitions to fatigue or something very, very powerful. And that's where creatine really comes into play. So of all three of the energy systems, creatine seems to have the greatest predominance in the anaerobic alactic system. Or think of the energy system you use in the first 10 seconds of an explosive sprint or, you know, maybe the first six or seven repetitions of a heavy squat. You really need a lot of energy. You're recruiting those type two muscle fibers. And ironically, those are the muscle fibers we start to lose in the fourth decade leading on. And that's referred to as sarcopenia. We preserve these type one muscle fibers. Those are the ones you use walking, maybe light activities, but explosive activities, type two muscle fibers. And unfortunately, they do are are reduced with aging. And that's why we think aging individuals may need a bit more creatine to offset the rate of loss. Right. And this is where resistance training comes in as well, right? Because you are also engaging in this. If you are, let's say you're doing a squat, as you were saying, or a leg press or something, you slow down on that descent and then you can like power up, right? You can have that explosive power to come back up, to stand back up if, you have, you know, if you're doing a barbell squat or something. And that that is also using this anaerobic system as well. And it's primarily those type two fibers, correct? That's correct. Anything that's explosive to you or you're putting in maximal effort would be the anaerobic A lactic and then less uh, reliance on the anaerobic a lactic system, which primarily uses carbohydrates for energy. Uh, but walking and things like that, you're using the aerobic. So creatine got but it got famous basically for enhancing the anaerobic A lactic system, or that system that requires a massive amount of energy or recruitment. And the recruitment is your type two muscle fibers. Right. And it's that first, as you said, it's like the first 10 seconds of a sprint, you know, if you see even like the 100 meter dash, like it's probably all phosphocreatine. If you see the 200 meter, it's like at some point they got to switch that aerobic glycolysis. And then, you know, there's like this sort of biological fork in the road, let's say. So this is why we never miss friends, never let friends miss leg day, right? This is why. <laughs> okay. For many reasons. Yes. And the other big one is the biggest muscles are in the low, below the belly button. Let's put it that way. Yeah. And if you do miss leg day, especially as you get older, that is catastrophic. We've shown now that you may need to double the amount of volume in the lower limbs compared to the upper because you're having muscle atrophy. Those type two muscle fibers are being compromised. And we've actually shown in a meta-analysis that your fossil creatine kinetics are sort of more jeopardized in the vastus lateralis or the quadricep muscle compared to the mm-hmm. calf. Mm-hmm. And where are the quadriceps activated? Well, that's sprinting, leg press, squat. Uh, unfortunately, as we get older, we typically refrain from that and do single joint movements um, or God forbid, take the escalator or elevator instead of taking the stairs. And 
And I think what we need to start looking at is power training or the ability to maintain activity as we get older. So I use the argument, if you need three sets for your bicep and, and tricep, you may need six as we get older for the lower muscle groups just to maintain the rate of loss. And we showed in a classic paper in 2005 that the lower body, unfortunately, as we get older, is more negatively affected than the upper body. So for anybody listening in the fourth decade or above, if you have the ability to activate your leg muscles, please do so and do so very often. Yeah, this was one of the tests that we did in the clinic all the time. It was like, can't it was like wall sit? What's your what's your number on wall sit? And then can you get up? You know, if we had a geriatric patient, it was like, can you get up from the chair without holding on to anything? If you can do that, can you get up off the floor without holding on to anything or using your hands? And then if you could do that, it's like, can you lie on your back and get up without using any assistance? It's all your legs, your core, you know, proprioception balance, all that kind of stuff. Um, and a really interesting thing, researcher Stu Phillips out of McMaster University and my colleagues, we've done two small meta-analysis. And lo and behold, when creatine was combined with resistance training, these individuals got an improvement in gait speed and sit to stand. And this is two of the, the hallmark, as you just mentioned, that we sort of assess functionality. And interestingly enough, from a global perspective, functionality is now sort of housed in with muscle mass and strength to diagnose sarcopenia. So I think it's something that was often overlooked, but now there is a good focal point, which is very advantageous. And so just the, this is for, you know, my nerdy, the nerds that are listening and just for my own nerdy inquiry is the, is the, so the mechanism of creatine supplementation, is it when we're preserving the type two fibers or adding to it as we age? So my, my big philosophy is like, you have to keep at least what you got, but ideally add on to it. Is it the sarcomere? that's lengthening? Is it the donation of satellite, the transcript? Like what, what is happening with creatine supplementation that is causing yeah. this amplification or this augmenting, this augmented effect with resistance training? Yeah. The thought is there's about 10 mechanisms that sort of come together. But to your point, the theory with hypertrophy, not hyperplasia is that sarcomeres do in series but a study, this, a paper just came out this year where we think they will now lengthen in parallel so they can get an increase in cross-sectional area and length. And yeah, and therefore the sarcomere, when you flex it, will get healthier from not only a length, but by width uh, perspective. Jose Antonio and, and uh, Mike Roberts, who is one of the best researchers in the world at Auburn, they've speculated that hyperplasia probably does exist. We just don't have the technology to look at those muscle fibers splitting. But some of the mechanisms why we think could contribute to that, satellite cells and transcription factors seem to get activated. There's some proteins in the mTOR pathway that have been shown to get upregulated when the cell is swelling. So I think water influx or osmosis could be one of the driving factors from a cellular perspective. We just talked about fossil creatine. We think that is one of the main reasons people get stronger. Calcium and glycogen is involved there as well. But from an anabolic perspective, we think insulin-like growth factor is also involved there. So there's a whole gamut uh, of factors. But it's important to know creatine has never been shown to directly increase the rates of myofibular protein synthesis. So unlike leucine and whey protein, which increases protein synthesis directly, uh, creatine has not been shown that. We think it works in a, in a sort of a, a multifactorial way to do that. But creatine also has anti-catabolic effects, which I think do contribute to the net anabolic effect. <laughs> There's good evidence in rodents that it has an anti-inflammatory uh, effect and an anti-catabolic effect from muscle protein breakdown. Right. So that net protein synthesis is is maybe... 5%, you know, I don't know what the number might be, but maybe there's, there's a, there's a, there's going to be more preservation of the net of the muscle protein synthesis than there is degradation. That's an excellent way to put it. It seems to cause a, a sort of a, an anabolic and an anti-catabolic effect, but this is a great question for my students on a multiple choice question because they think creatine makes the, the individual bigger, but it's interesting. We've never been able to show it increases muscle protein synthesis directly. Like, you know, if you take a whey protein or, 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 or a, a casein, it, it does. But so creatine sort of works in a, in a bunch of other ways. There's about 10 purported mechanisms that seem to be very viable. But ironically, the vast majority of these mechanisms have only been shown in younger adults. We still have a long way to go to show that do these satellite cells and IGF-1 and, and decrease in myostatin, 
Does that happen in older adults? And again, those mechanisms are primarily only in young males. So again, we need to look at the effects of estrogen or progesterone on potentially these effects as well. So I think the the focus on creatine will be there for the next few decades. And hopefully we incorporate, incorporate a lot more uh, females across the lifespan and get more mechanistic data. Amen. Can I get can I get an amen? You know, it's like always like the university students, like it's the young men in universities that are like signing up because they need to pay for their bills or whatever. That's where so much of our literature is done. So I'm so happy, and you're you know one of the one of the uh, leaders I would say in the field that is really having this conversation around specifically creating and, and and the let's say the arc of a woman's life, right? So how this changes over the arc of her hormonal life, perimenopause as well. <laughs> 